Get ready for unique, rare, and little-known treasures from the golden age of radio. You're listening to The Amazing World of Radio with Adam Graham. Welcome, and be sure to send emails to box13 at greatdetectives.net. We're continuing our Mr. Blanding series, and after last week's program, I think listeners will appreciate that this program is provided by Radio Archives. This is one of two episodes that was on their Archive Masters Volume 1 set. Radio Archives produces high-quality old-time radio collections, pulp fiction reprint ebooks, and pulp audiobooks. And you can obtain a sample of all three products by sending an email to detectives at radioarchives.com. In addition, they have preserved 36,000 old-time radio transcription transfers, which they are making available by subscription at a rate of 600 transfers per month. You can get a sample with the first month of transfers, 600 different files from the Golden Age of Radio for only $59.98 at transfers.greatdetectives.net. The entirety of your purchase price supports the podcast, and if you like what you hear, you can continue with a subscription to get 600 program transfers per month for $60 per month, which is half off the usual rate. Just go to transfers.greatdetectives.net to try it. Well, now let's get into Mr. and Mrs. Blanding's original air date, February 25th, 1951, and the title is... Jim and Television, Friend or Foes. Transcribe. Flying's the way to travel, and the way to fly is TWA, Trans World Airlines. <laughs> Presenting Cary Grant and Betsy Drake as Mr. and Mrs. Blandings in a new series based on Eric Hodgins' best-selling novels, Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House and Blandings Way. Did you know that TWA offers the only one airline service from coast to coast in the United States and all the way to Europe, Africa, and Asia? You love to fly. You ride the airways, star-reached airways Smoother and swifter, flying the way And the best way to fly, T-W-A Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake With Gail Gordon as Bill Cole A hard day's work in the life of Jim Blandings has a new, rich reward. His new home in Connecticut. A peaceful evening in front of the fire with his wife, Muriel. Today, more than ever, Muriel has looked forward to the sound of Jim's key in the lock because she has a surprise for him. A new television set. A television set that, deep in her heart, she knows Jim does not want. Well, listen, there's his key now. Should have a key somewhere. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Got it. Oh, I'm pushing in too far again. Mm-hmm. Oh, there it is. Muriel. Muriel. Where is everybody? Isn't anybody home? Uh, oh, hello, Rover. Oh, Rover, Rover, get your paws off my shoulders. Muriel. Upstairs, dear. Upstairs. Down, Rover. Down, down. down. No, no, no. Rover, lean away from the door. What? You've got the whole wall to lean on. Now, if you don't mind, I'd like to open the closet door. (coughs) Rover, I can hang up my coat. Be right down, dear. Don't bother, Muriel. I'm coming up. I'll come down. No, Muriel. 
Now, Rover, be a nice sheepdog. Get off the steps. <laughs> Get off! Are you all right? Did you fall down, Jim? No, Rover fell down. <laughs> Rover fell down, that's all. Rover thinks so, too. Well, I'm sorry I couldn't come down right away. I wasn't dressed. Are you going up? I was going up to see you. Well, here I am. Ah, yeah. Yes, you are. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> mm. What do you smell like? Are you guessing, or do you want me to tell you? I couldn't possibly guess, but I like it. I'm glad. It's a perfume that you gave to me. I saved it to wear for a special occasion. Oh, good Lord, Muriel. It's not our anniversary so soon. Seems to me it was only last month. It was only last month. Now, come on. I've got a surprise to show you. Huh? Uh, where is it? In the living room. Close your eyes. Well, how can I see to get there? Hold my hand. Well, I like that part. <laughs> Uh, uh, may I open my eyes now? No. First, I've got to make a little speech. Well, may I sit down, then? Well, perhaps you'd better... No, don't look yet. Well, where's Rover? It's funny you should ask that. Were you peeking just then? No, Muriel, I just didn't want to sit on Rover. <laughs> Where is he? He's guarding the surprise. Well, what is it, a herd of sheep? <laughs> <laughs> if you can stop laughing at your own joke. Uh, now, stop it. You can stop laughing at it. This is what I've got to explain before you look. Right, and when you do, you love it. That's what I think. Yeah. You know, Mira, I've got a funny feeling. When you talk like that, that's what you don't think. But go on, dear. Well, if you remember correctly, about three weeks ago, we decided that the wall near the mirror, don't look, needed something. You said you thought a nice, um, oh, say... Chippendale cabinet of some sort, and, and I agreed. So now you can open your eyes and look at the surprise because you'll love it. <laughs> Jim, wake up. Huh? What, 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 what? Oh! Look at the surprise. Oh, you're a nice surprise, Muriel. Now stop looking at me. Look at the surprise. Oh, <laughs> oh. Muriel. A television set, how could you? Isn't it charming? Chippendale. Muriel, you know how I feel about television. But you can't keep on being old-fashioned, and besides, look what it does for that wall. Old-fashioned because I want peace and quiet when I come home? Old-fashioned because I want to preserve the art of conversation? Old-fashioned because I want my daughters to study? Hmm. Yeah, look what it does to the wall. I'm hmm. sorry, I failed you. Send it back. You send it back. You deceived me, Muriel. Wouldn't you like me to turn it on, just for fun? If you do, I'll close my eyes again. Let me show you what it can do. I'd want to show it what I can do. Now, Muriel, I want that set out of here tomorrow. How much was it? Five fifty. Five fifty? You mean to say you pay five hundred and fifty dollars for that thing? Get it out of here tonight. <laughs> Impossible. Muriel, we discussed buying a Chippendale cabinet, not a television set. Now, I'm going to call the store. They've got to take it back. Where's the bill? I'll get it. But it is a Chippendale cabinet. <laughs> We did not discuss what would be in the cabinet. Here's the bill. Oh. $700? Muriel, this bill is for $700. I know that, but I've saved you money. We have a Chippendale cabinet and a television set for the price of a Chippendale cabinet, $550. This bill is for $700. I know that, but the aerial cost $100. What? And Mr. Drop charged $50 to install it. It's very hard work jiggling around on the roof. Hmm. The next thing you'll tell me is that we not only have a Chippendale cabinet and a television set, but a bird roost as well. <laughs> Dinner's ready, Miss Blanding. <coughs> now, we'll be there in a moment, Maud. Take Rover with you. Rover? <coughs> come on, Rover. Come out from under that beautiful new television set. <coughs> I said take Rover with you, Maud. Well, he's coming with me, Mr. Blanding. He is not. He is. Well, of course, the trouble with that silly dog is I can't tell which end is which. <laughs> I thought he was coming toward me. <laughs> Why don't you go upstairs and wash your face in cold water? You'll feel better. I feel quite all right, Muriel, but I will anyway. And by the time I come down, I trust that you will have arranged with Mr. Drop to get his set. It's too late to call. And, you know, I'd like to remind you, Muriel, that you could have gotten a new dress for what we have to pay for putting that aerial up on the roof and taking it down again. Well, I'm not selfish. I like to buy things for the whole family to enjoy. That's right, Muriel. Well, you're either very clever or you have the reasoning powers of a tangerine. But you're not selfish. (laughs) 
Yes, Mr. Fleet. Well, that's right, yes. But, well, I think Mr. Guider Jr. ought to plan the television advertising for that account. No, Mr. Fleet. No, no, it's just that I've got my hands full with... Yes. Yeah. Oh, get that, please, Margaret. Yes, sir. Oh, just a moment, please. What, what? Mr. Blanding's busy right now. Well, no, Mr. Fleet. I simply feel that Guider Jr. is better suited to television than I am. Yes, he is. He likes it, Mr. Fleet. Oh, very well. I'll reconsider, Mr. Fleet, but I'm afraid that I still think Mr. Guider Jr. is the man for the job. Goodbye, Mr. Fleet. I'll be darned if I'll reconsider. Let Guider Jr. do the television. All I hear is television these days. Now, where were we, Margaret? Uh, Mr. Cole is on the phone, Mr. Blandings. Oh. Sorry you had to wait, Mr. Cole. Here's Mr. Blandings now. Thank you, Margaret. Hello, Bill. Mr. Jim, I've got an important favor to ask of you. No, you cannot visit us next weekend. We want to be alone. I had no intention of inviting myself for the weekend. Well, that's unusual. <laughs> All right, I never lend money. Uh, look, look, I'm in a phone booth. May I ask my favor before my nickel runs out? Ask it? Would you appear this evening on What Why? I didn't say anything. <laughs> Would you? What are you talking about? Well, I was supposed to appear on their panel tonight, but I've got to avoid some people. Mm, or vice versa. Oh, now, seriously, Jim, I can't be on the panel when I've told everybody I'd be out of town. I suggested you, and the panel jumped at it. They pay very well. They do? What for? I'm asking if you will appear on a television program. Five cents for the next five minutes, please. Uh, oh, yes, yeah, just, just a minute, just a minute. Appear on what? Why? That's right. Thank you. Uh, uh, what did I say? <laughs> Why are you so dense? I'm trying to tell you that if you would appear as guest on the television show What Why, tonight, in my place, I'd greatly appreciate it. And so would the panel. Furthermore... Appear on television? That's what I've been oh. saying all along. You're mad. I hate Fur television. Furthermore, they pay very well, and it's distinguished. They only ask important people. Hmm. Important people, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. For some reason, they think you are important. Distinguished, huh? Yes. Yes, and they pay very well. How much? Uh, they'll discuss that later. Will you do it? Mm, might not be so bad. What did you say? I'll do it. Yes, I'll do it. What time? Where? Yeah, put Margaret on. I'll give her all the instructions. All right, all right. Well, now, calm down and put Margaret on. I've run out of nickel. What, what? Put Margaret on and hurry. <laughs> Hello? Muriel? Jim? Listen carefully, dear. I've got wonderful news. I'm listening. I'm going to appear tonight on What Why. What? What Why. They have very distinguished guests. What? Muriel, pay attention. I am. But they only invite important people. <laughs> of course, they seem to feel that I'm pretty important. You are? Who's they? The panel of What Why. Oh. <laughs> You don't sound enthusiastic. Well, if you tell me what what why is and why a panel asked you, perhaps I'd tell... Muriel, I've told you once. I'm not going to tell you again. All right. Well, I'm calling because I want you to tune in tonight and watch me. On what? What why? Why are you so dense? <laughs> I'm going to be on at 8 o'clock, station WNBT. The program is very distinguished. Now, don't forget to watch. Watch on what? Well, on our television set, of course. What makes you think we have a television set? Well, because we've got one. That's why I think we've got one. We don't anymore. You told me to return it to the store, but we've still got the aerial. <laughs> what do you mean the set's gone? Already? So soon? Already so soon. Muriel, get it back. I thought you hated it. Not when I'm on it. <laughs> Call Mr. Drop right away and get our set back. Jim, you do nothing but confuse me. But okay, okay. And watch, watch, why? Tell the children to watch. Too bad you can't watch. That's right. Goodbye. Good luck. Thank you. Don't be nervous. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> I do. Mr. Drop sold our set. Well, hasn't he got another one? No. Jim will be furious. Well, can't you go to a neighbor's house and see him on their set? I don't know any that have set. That's why I phoned you. Well, all right, Muriel. I know I'm nuts to do this, but I'll come out. I'll bring my portable set. Oh, Bill, that's wonderful. I wouldn't say anything to Jim if I were you. Why not? Well, he might not care for the idea. 
that I'm spending the evening alone with his wife. Oh, dear, that's true. Maud's out, and the girls will be at a brownie meeting. The scouts are lending them a set to see the show. And they're spending the night with the Williams girls afterwards. Well, perhaps you'd better join them. At the meeting? Oh, the girls are ashamed of me. They say I'm too old. <laughs> I'll be out. We won't be alone, Bill. We won't? No. Jim will be right there on television. <laughs> Hey, Tom, have you contacted Weathership Charlie yet? Yes, it's coming in now. Hello, DWA 9 or 6 3. This is Coast Guard Weathership Charlie, reading you loud and clear. Our radar indicates your position at 0826 Zebra is 352 degrees true, 42 nautical miles from Station Charlie. Your speed, made good, is 350 knots. Winds at your altitude. Far, are from... far below TWA's overseas bound constellations, the weather ships of the United States Coast Guard stand watch on the North Atlantic. Stretched across the ocean like stepping stones, these ships gather vital information on the weather, plot positions, and send out radio signals that guide the planes to their destinations. This weather information not only helps airlines to plot the best routes to take overseas from day to day, but once the planes are aloft, the pilots are kept constantly up to date on the ever-changing weather pattern, a tremendous contribution to modern airline operation. And so today, TWA, Trans World Airlines, salutes the courageous, hard-working men of the Coast Guard and Weather Bureau who are supplying this vital, accurate weather information to the scheduled airlines of the world, and in so doing, contribute greatly to the safety, comfort, and speed you, the passenger, enjoy on every transatlantic flight. And now the second act of Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Jim Blandings, invited to appear on the television program, What, Why?, is delighted at his sudden prominence. To be considered this important in his profession, advertising, makes him quite forget his loathing of the medium. He has insisted that Muriel get back the set, which had been such an unwelcome surprise. Muriel was too late. The set had been sold. At Muriel's request, Bill Cole has just arrived out from New York with his portable television set, and is trying to tune in the program, What, Why? Can't you make the aerial any longer? I don't see a thing. The aerial is as long as it will ever be. <laughs> oh. I'll uh, point it in another direction. Try spinning it. You won't like what happens. I don't like what's happening now. What time is it? One minute of eight. What? <laughs> Jim will be on at eight. Do something. Well, what do you suggest? I don't know. It's your set. Fix it. Well, it works beautifully in New York. It has no right to be so persnickety. I love the country. Well, <laughs> ah, 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 here we go, here we go. Yeah. Bill, look. Tell me what you see. Could be either a blowtorch But or it's not Jim. Do something. Muriel, will you keep calm? I, I'll move the set over to the other end of the room. Keep calm? Jim is on the air right now, and I can't see him. <laughs> Driver? Driver? What time is it, for heaven's sakes? I don't know, kid. Well, <laughs> haven't you got a watch? What'd you say? I said, haven't you got a watch? Sure I have, kid. Well, what time is it? Uh, one minute to late. So what, you're late, kid? Oh. Oh, I'm supposed to be there now. Uh, where are we? Where well, you asked me to take it, that's all I know, kid. That'll be a buck seventy. All right. Uh, have you got change for five dollars? No, try the drugstore, kid. Keep the change, kid. Oh. Going up. Going up. Going up. Wait for me. Fifteen, please. This is a local car. Only goes as far as fourteen. Take oh. the other car, please. What other car? Where? Around the corner. All expresses around the corner. Oh, all right. Wait. 
Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Whoops. <laughs> Fifteen out, please. What, whatever are you doing on the floor, <sighs> sir? Looking for my stomach. <laughs> oh, dear, I'm nervous enough. Yes, sir. Can you tell me where Studio C is, please? What show? What, why? What, why? Yes, yes, what, why? I'm almost ten minutes late. Where is Studio C? Oh, I'm sorry, sir. You're in the wrong building. Oh. What, why is on a different network? You want NBC. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> We've missed half the program. Do something. Muriel, Muriel, keep calm. I'll try sticking the aerial out the window. <laughs> are you sure there are no new mountains around here? Jim will be furious. Now, you watch. I'll work on the aerial. Tell me if you see anything. Nothing yet. Now? No. Now? No. Wait a minute, Bill. It's working. Good, good, good. Get the right station now. All right, all right. Hold on, hold on. Ah, that's it. It can't be. Muriel, it is. See that huge can of apple juice behind them? That's the sponsor. <laughs> well, where's Jim? I don't see Jim. Driver, why have you stopped? The light's green. I hope you don't expect me to drive right through the pedestrians, sir. They have no right to be crossing against the light. Jaywalkers! <laughs> People are silly, sir. Oh, this is the end. What time is it? Uh, 8.20, sir. Oh, my... Oh, never mind. What's the use? Driver, take me to Grand Central Station. I'm going home. <laughs> Well, it's almost 10 o'clock. Jim ought to be home any minute. Yes. Oh, cheer up, Muriel. Yes. Perhaps I should go on back to New York. Please don't. I can't face Jim alone. Well, that's a terrible thing to say. I know it. Muriel, Jim will be on other programs. You'll see him on television. You don't understand. What don't I understand? Well, yesterday I got a television set to surprise Jim which he didn't want, but he should have, because it was also a Chippendale cabinet, which he did want. I see. I think. And he got mad and told me to return it, which I did. Then he called up and told me to watch what, why. Then he got mad again because I'd returned the set. Now he's been on television, and he'll be mad again because I didn't see him. So no matter what I do, I'm wrong. Oh, Muriel, no, really. I'm wrong. Always wrong. Don't know what to do about it. <laughs> I've got an idea. We've got my television set here. And what a set. We can let Jim think we did see him. How? Oh, we can pretend we saw him. <laughs> then later you can tell him the truth. He'll think it's a good joke. Oh, but suppose he asks us questions about the program. What do we say then? Well, I... Oh, that's Jim at the door now. I'm sure I'm going to say the wrong thing. Now, wait a second, Muriel. I'm a lawyer. That's my business. I'm used to dealing with criminals. Uh... <laughs> With, with people like him. I can draw him out. But what will I say? Nothing, nothing. Let me do the talking. I'll make him tell us all about the show. Then if he asks us any questions, he'll already have told us all the answers. Muriel! Jim! Oh. Oh, hello, Bill. What are you doing here? Oh, he saved the day. Mm hmm What was the matter with it? <laughs> He brought out his portable television set so that we could see you on what, why. Where's the set we had? Uh, Muriel couldn't get it back in time. Uh -huh. So I brought out my portable. Great little set. We loved the show, Jim. <laughs> you did? Um, tell us, dear, were you nervous? Mm. Do you mind if we go into the living room? Standing around in the hall makes me feel as though I ought to say goodnight and leave. <laughs> uh... Nice group of people on the What Why panel, don't you think? Sit here, Jim. You must be very tired. Uh, yes, and tell us about the show, Jim. We're very interested in your reaction to television as a medium. Frightfully interesting, I'd say. It must have been. Yeah. Mm. I particularly liked my answer to that question on North American glaciers, didn't you, Muriel? 
Oh, very interesting. <laughs> Frankly, I was so delighted just watching you. Uh, that... Don't you remember, Muriel? Bill? Uh, why, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> you said that you thought... The... <laughs> <laughs> the audience loved it. <laughs> That's right. Oh, very clever. Uh, do you really believe that, Jim? Believe what? <laughs> what you said about the glaciers. What did I say about the glaciers? Don't you know, Jim? Oh, well, so many questions. Uh, Muriel. Mm -hmm. How did yes, you like sir. the reaction to... to the... Yes! <laughs> did you two notice it when I sneezed, by the way? I should say we did. You can't hide a sneeze from me. Oh, dear me. I'm sorry to hear that. I thought that by bending down to pick up a pencil, nobody would notice. But if you did, Oh, Muriel, you couldn't fool me. Do you know something, Muriel? You couldn't fool me either. <laughs> Don't try to fool you when I sneeze, dear. I sneeze away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and what did you think, Bill, when I had that small disagreement with a member of the panel on the subject of lawyers? Oh, I was on your side. You were? Yes, we were. Even when I told the audience and the panel that my wife and lawyer were both big fakes? You didn't. All right, Jim, you win. How did you know? I'm psychic. <laughs> Jim, I promise you we did our best. How did you know, Jim? Imagine the two of you lying to me for shame. But, Jim, I didn't want to make you angry. Well, didn't you realize how much lying would hurt me? Well, now, don't blame Muriel, Jim. It was my advice to her. I should have known. What did you say about the glaciers, Jim? I didn't say a darn thing about them. <laughs> oh, missed the question. Missed the program. <laughs> Never got there. Wrong building. Traffic. Idiotic taxi driver afraid of running over idiotic people. Came home. Well, this is cozy. We've all been lying. I'm so glad. Mm. <laughs> and Muriel, I hate television more than ever. Oh. Hello. Yes? What? <clears throat> Certainly. <clears throat> Certainly. By all means. Oh. oh, well, just say a young advertising man. A successful young advertising man. Good, good. Talk about money later. What you are. Goodbye. <clears throat> what do you know? What? Well, the uh, television panel of 30 answers heard that I was going to appear on What, Why tonight, so they asked me to be on their show next week. <laughs> Oh, how wonderful. Oh, as to be expected, I imagine. Uh, prominent people are prominent people. <clears throat> Muriel, uh, what about some dinner? I'm starved. All right, Jim. I love you so much when you're happy. Oh, and I love you, Muriel. I even like you, Bill. Oh, thank you. <laughs> oh, Muriel, call Mr. Drop and order another set. We're getting back the one we had. But I thought you couldn't. Well, we couldn't then, but Mr. Drop called an hour ago and told me the woman who bought it is returning it tomorrow. Oh, uh uh-huh. -huh. She said her husband just hated television. Uh. <laughs> Cary Grant and Betsy Drake will be with us in just a moment. Where in the world do you want to go? TWA and only TWA serves 60 cities in the United States from San Francisco to New York and takes you overseas to key cities of Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. And this one airline service is mighty important, as any experienced world traveler will tell you. You buy only one ticket. You enjoy the same courteous service all the way, and you don't have to worry about complicated connections. So remember... TWA goes all the way across the U.S. and overseas, too. Next time you plan a trip, for business or pleasure, see your travel agent or call your nearest TWA office. You love to fly high up in the sky. You ride the airways, star-reached airways. Smoother and swifter, flying the way. And the best way to fly, TWA. Here again are Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. What's the matter, dear? Tired? Yeah, but it sure feels good just to be relaxing in a comfortable chair. Then you don't regret it. 
Regret what? When we were choosing furniture, you wanted to buy the kind of reclining chair TWA has in its constellation. Well, you know, that's not so silly. Come on, you can really relax in those seats. Mm -hmm. Relax and stretch your legs out. Mm -hmm. Just push a button and the back reclines just where you want it. You know, Muriel, I'll bet you couldn't be more comfortable anywhere than in a TWA Constellation chair. I bet you I could. Where? Sitting right here in your lap. Oh. Well, that's not a bad idea. Constellations have flaps. I wonder if they could build in some laps. (laughs) Good night, dear. Good night, everyone. Tune in next week, same time, same station, for Mr. and Mrs. Blanding, starring Cary Grant and Betsy Drake. Brought to you by Transworld Airlines. Across the U.S. and overseas, you can depend on TWA. (laughs) Betsy Drake appeared through the courtesy of RKO Pictures and David O. Selznick. Watch for the next Selznick release, Gypsy Blood, starring Jennifer Jones and produced in Technicolor. Bill Cole was played by Gail Gordon. Others in our cast were Gail Bonney, Gene Bates, Marion Richmond, Ed Max, Jerry Hausner, and Earl Keane. Tonight's show was written by M. Winkle, directed by Warren Lewis, and transcribed in Hollywood. Don Stanley speaking. <laughs> Now it's Tallulah's Big Show. Three chimes mean good times on NBC. This definitely gives uh, some keen insight into life with early television. And from this episode, we learn that early television resistance was broken down by offering those who were unsure about television a spot on a TV panel program. It was expensive, but it ultimately was successful. In all seriousness, I think that there wasn't actually a whole lot of firm resistance to television. Television had been anticipated since before World War II. There were some different religious groups that were not thrilled with television. You know, there were some people who had some real intellectual objections. But I think consumers did have to make a choice, you know, when it came to things like cost and quality because early television was first of all really expensive this set that the blandings bought we're told it cost five hundred and fifty dollars that's more than six thousand one hundred dollars in today's money to give you an idea on how much that is I went on Amazon to find the most over-the-top model of TV, and the one that I could find uh, in terms of a plasma TV was a 98-inch screen that was on sale for $5,000. Now, doubtless some of you could find a more expensive television, but the point is that you were paying a lot of money if you were buying a television in 1951. And the type of programming that was going to be available to you, there was a sort of stereotypical flavor. You know, you would get old movies, wrestling, and a few kinescopes, which were live television programs of often dubious quality. So if you waited to buy a television set, the quality of programming would improve, and you would also end up paying less money for your set. Now, Jim does not actually have a good reason why he doesn't want a TV set. Nothing that he actually says of the television could equally apply to the radio. I don't know, maybe it had something to do with the fact that RCA owned NBC and was expanding into television, and you did not want to have any reasonable argument that a listener might say, you know what, that's a good point. I think I will not buy an RCA television. 
So instead, they talked and they said, well, okay, what motivation can we give Jim for not wanting a television that would be believable? And somebody said, you know, it's Jim Blanding, so we can just have him do it to be contrary and ornery. And the scene where they were working to tune in the station, even though it was from the 1950s, anyone who ever worked with getting channels over the air can relate. And it's not something that many Gen Z folks will relate to. But you would often struggle to get channels and you would have to do all sorts of tricks. And because you're not like an electronics engineer, it feels like you're doing voodoo or something to improve reception. You do things that work, but you have no idea why it actually works to do that. Of course, we had the retirement of the analog channels, and now everything is supposed to be digital. And so a lot of folks just have no idea what this was like. Although, I do have one of the digital antennas, because I don't have dish or satellite. And on one of those rare occasions where I need to watch a local channel... I've often had to go through similar rituals. So if you've got a thirst for nostalgia, you can turn off the cable, get one of those things, and maybe show uh, kids what it's like, depending on the area. And it helps for that exercise if you get a really cheap antenna. I also found the sponsor to be a really interesting choice. I've yet to encounter another radio program that had an airline as a sponsor. And so those commercials are interesting to listen to, particularly when they're describing the seating on the airplane. And those of us who have only flown in the 21st century have to wonder, was it ever actually as comfortable as it's portrayed in those commercials? Because most of us don't think of comfort when we think of airline travel. I'm not being too harsh about it because I get that modern airlines operate on a really tight margin The cabin crew are all nice as can be. And really, the miracle of air travel is something we take for granted. Crossing the ocean from Seattle to Hawaii in five hours makes being cramped into a middle seat kind of worth it. But you can't help but wonder if there was a point where it was actually comfortable too. The bill and... Muriel thing continues on to the radio program, and I think it's a little too silly to actually be funny at this point. In the movie, I think it served a purpose to try and continue doing it through the radio series as like this obligatory thing. Well, Muriel, I I guess we have to go ahead and make Jim jealous of our completely platonic relationship. But of course, the way the writing goes, I guess a husband might get suspicious regardless if every time wife and her bachelor ex-boyfriend are in the house, both the housekeeper and the children are gone. At some point, a husband, even an understanding one, is going to be like, Hey, haven't the kids and the housekeeper been gone the last six times Bill's been over with you? And Jim is, alas, not a very understanding husband. In fact, at the end of the story, I was kind of feeling sorry for Muriel, which I think is a bit of a failing of the comedy. Because a spouse can be exasperating, and it can be funny. But honestly, at this point, Jim is a lot. He is incredibly insistent on his own way, but also incredibly fickle, so she's like, how am I even going to make him happy? So hopefully the comedy will get a little bit better so it doesn't feel like, oh, this poor woman. Well, that will do it for today. If you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.